if I wanted to develop an exercise program that was specifically targeted with the primary objective of keeping my brain as healthy mm-hmm. as long as possible, not necessarily my body composition or muscle or strength or anything yeah. like that. Um, I wanted to do an exercise program for that. One could theoretically say, okay, lift weights a couple of days a week mm-hmm. in exactly what you mentioned. You know, five to eight exercises, whole body, a yeah. couple sets each. Yeah. That'd be two days a week. Mm. One day a week, do something that is closer. Let's just even say the Norwegian, yeah. four by four. That's a great option, yeah. Four minutes of the highest amount of work. Mm-hmm. People get mad when you describe this as four minutes of max effort or yeah. all out. Yeah, yeah. You can't go not, all out for yeah, four yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah. But the, the highest amount of work you can do for four minutes, yeah. rest for four minutes and do it again. I don't really think, friends, like I cannot imagine a world in which that specificity matters. Yeah. You don't have to do the four. You could probably yeah, yeah. do just about any type yeah. of high intensity endurance conditioning work, and it would probably be the same. But let's just say for simplicity, you did four by four once or twice a week. Was that those interventions? I think they were doing it three times a week. Okay. But if you're doing other aerobic exercise and and resistance training, I think you're going to, yeah, you're probably not going to need to do like a four by four three times a week. That That's sucks. pretty damn hard. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for six <laughs> months Extended straight. Extended periods of time, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say realistically as an exercise scientist, I'll give you permission to cut that to two yeah. per week. Yeah. And then maybe one to two or three sessions a week of the more lower intensity standard endurance exercise, cardio, uh, whether this is even physical activity, walking, yeah, uh, or would they actually need to do more like 50, 60% heart rate for that kind of cardiovascular adaptation? So, you know, this is the, this is the, the age old question is like, it, like what's the exact intensity required to yeah. see a specific adaptation? I think that and it's the same. I uh, we did a we did a podcast talking about the four by four on study your podcast on, on my podcast, yeah. and um, then somebody was like, "Well, what if I can't maintain my heart rate in that zone yeah. for that long?" Or like, okay. just do yeah, right, do whatever you can for four minutes, and you right, you'll get better over time. And so I think it's I think it's the same thing. Yeah, like if it's a if it's a casual stroll, you're probably not getting um, an adaptation. But you know, equally, if if a brisk walk is hard work for you, right, then that's going to be. That, that that's going to be a good good place to be. Yeah, like this one riles me up so much because I, I get it. People want like specific numbers, but I'm so resistant to do that because it doesn't actually matter yeah. usually. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a it's a rough concept of where you're at. Mm-hmm. So if those numbers help you, great. Yeah. But something like that, um, here's the reality: don't think that your brain all of a sudden won't adapt. Yeah. If you do half that. Yeah. yeah. If you did one day of lifting, one day of intervals, and a couple of days of walking. It's better than the zero. Oh, yeah. It's a lot better, yeah. right? So you don't have to hit that minimum number to get any effect yeah. whatsoever, right? Probably getting closer to that final mm-hmm. destination. But if that takes you six months or six years to get to where you can handle that, that being that little three, you yeah. know, protocol we talked about, it's fine. Yeah. Like get there eventually yeah. and, and you'll probably get um, much of the benefit, which, yeah. which is great. This actually answers a big question that I have dealt with a lot. Uh, you and I actually have a, a, a paper together, again, that you led where we found physical strength predicted, I think it was 5% yeah. of cognitive function, mm-hmm. right? And I'll, I'll say that again. Like physical strength predicted 5% of cognitive function. I have talked about, people have talked about at length how leg strength, how grip strength, grip strength fires people up, right? Yeah. And, and the common claim here is like, oh, grip strength is just a proxy for overall health. Yeah. And certainly true. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at research on folks that have dementia, you will see, a, a, I think actually one paper found, I can't even think it was a UK Biobank paper, but a half a million people in it found that I think 30% of Alzheimer's death was explained by low grip strength. Yeah. Right? Not a small number. Like, and there's a recent study showing that frailty precede, like, precedes like Alzheimer's by, by several years on average. Multiple years, I yeah. imagine, right? Yeah. And and right, if you're frail, you're not doing all the things that we know continue to stimulate or support brain right. function, right? So what I want you to kill, and probably, perhaps <laughs> this is the fifth thing that'll irritate the internet that we're going to call, <laughs> is the idea that this stuff, the grip strength, leg strength, is exclusively an indirect or mm. a correlation, right? Of course, there's some yeah. folks who are struggling with dementia are probably also then going to struggle with movement and mm. there'll be a backwards direction, right? There, there'd there be a causation, but it would kind of be backwards yeah. causation, right? So, and this horrible idea 
that strength is only a correlation to brain health. And you just actually kind of answered the question before, which yeah. is like, how is it actually causal? But then spell this out as directly as possible so I can cut this clip and send it to people every <laughs> damn time I get told, it's just a correlation. Technically, people are right. A lot of this comes from epidemiological yeah. research. No doubt. Correlation isn't causation. Um, however, there are several studies we just talked about, some where you randomize somebody to a resistance training intervention, their strength improves, brain function improves, right? Brain structure improves. And actually, related to the point that you're making, in that in one of those studies, yes, you see sustained improvements in white matter structure with two sessions a week, but you've got improvements in cognitive function with just one session a week, right? So Bingo. you don't, these effects, particularly if people aren't doing much exercise, are essentially linear. And like- So I, 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 if you could ask for a more causal <laughs> function and structure benefit yeah. and in a dose response. Yeah. So I, I mean, what else do we that need That essentially here? says it's causal, right? Yeah. And people are, so depending on the type of research, of course, people are right. You, you you can't tell you can't tell causation. However, what people also don't necessarily understand is that in a perfect epidemiological study, if you could account for every confounder and you know mediating and moderating relationships, what you have left is causation. That is like by definition that is a definition of causation. So yeah. yes, epidemiological studies technically don't show causation, but if you could. It's difficult because you don't always get the variables you want, right? You can determine causation from an epidemiological study. That is possible. That's allowed in, you know, a frequentist model of statistics. I'll count that as like 4.5 thing that the internet's <laughs> going to get mad at. Yeah, you I don't, don't think people understand basic statistics with yeah. that. So, um, right. The people have worse physical health, right? We know. So in the study that we did, if you had higher uh, blood, blood sugar, high HbA1c, you had lower strength. But I think that's also bi-directional, right? You know, more insulin resistance, that's going to worsen um, a muscular function. But um, if we think about the potential mechanisms by which this happens, you have uh, if you're doing things that improve strength, that's a direct neuromuscular stimulus. We've already talked about the importance of stimulus. The next important thing is that your skeletal muscle is your biggest and most important glucose sink. So if we're thinking about the importance of energy regulation, then your muscle... Like the more muscle you have and the more you move it, the greater amount of glucose you can move through that system. And there's, I mean, this has been done for decades and decades and decades. So your your skeletal muscle and your physical activity are two of the best ways to improve glucose handling and energetic handling more broadly. And then the final piece is that when you uh, contract your muscles, you release a whole bunch of stuff, right? Your muscles are organs. So lactate, BDNF, MOTC, irisin, uh, LACV, like pick your metabolite. Cytokines, of, yeah. exokines, yeah, yeah, myokines. Yeah. IL-6, yeah. like, whatever, like whatever it is, like pick your favorite metabolite du jour. Right. Um, we're still discovering on it, like taurine, we're still discovering on a, like, on a weekly basis the things that are released during exercise that have broad, broad benefits. So like all of that comes together to suggest that, um, yes, it's a bi-directional relationship, but by improving muscular size and strength and function and those usually go together but not always depending on you know who you are um that's there is four or five if not more different mechanisms that would directly re relate to improvements in cognitive function and brain health if you enjoyed this clip you can watch the full episode by clicking here <laughs>